KennyRoy.com. I am Kenny Roy. This is the December 2010 lecture, and the topic is pantomime. Now, you might look at pantomime and you say, oh, well, that's no fun. Well, actually, that's kind of the entire point here. Pantomime is an extremely underdeveloped skill for animators. I see so many animators that have really, like, they have the best intentions, and they're, they're super focused on, on dialogue shots and acting and performance. And when it comes down to it, they're actually missing out on a lot of the, the, the basis and the fundamentals and the foundation of performance when they are not really looking at pantomime for, for what it really is and what it, what it can be, what it can mean to you. This uh, lecture, I'm just going to try to keep it under 90 minutes, somewhere between 60 and 90 minutes. So uh, go make yourself a hot cocoa and, and, uh, and relax and, and get ready for uh, some pantomime goodness. I'll wait until you uh, get your hot chocolate. In fact, pause. You pause it and then go get it and I'll, I'll be here. Okay, so now you're back with your hot chocolate. Okay, great. Now we can get started. Here we go. So pantomime... Um, animation lecture for December 2010. And without further ado, let's get it on. Importance. Obviously, we need to talk about the importance of pantomime and what it means to uh, animators, even if you're doing dialogue shots, even if you're doing, um, you know, non-human or non-bipedal. All of this, all of this, um, all of these categories still fall under the the importance of pantomime for animators in general. And I feel like we need to need to start over and, and talk about why we're here and why we are interested in performance and why we're interested in, in character work. Uh, in, and it all starts with pantomime. This is not supposed to be a pantomime review for you. This is supposed to be a renew. Oh, see what I did there? I underlined it. That's what I did. Um, what I'm trying to do is instill um, a, a new found passion for the art of silent acting that will permeate and improve and, and supplement all of the work that you're doing already. And so that's kind of my hope. And, and, and with this lecture, I am trying to touch on a few of the most important of, of pantomime and, and renew your, your, your sense of wonder or your sense of adventure with them. Okay. In, at Animation Mentor, for example, um, I absolutely love this school. And one of the things that they do fantastically is they have so much emphasis on silent performance before you even get a rig that has face controls. In fact, you're working with a rig that doesn't have anything but um, blinking eyeballs for a while. You may have seen, if you go to the school, you know, and if you don't go to the school, you may have seen that with the student demo reels that you see around the web. And it's that kind of emphasis that is extremely valuable. I said this in the lip sync lecture as well. In Animation Mentor, they, they give you a rig, they give you Bishop, but the Bishop that you get doesn't have any facial controls. He just has a jaw that's on a hinge. And again, I love the way that the school did that because you have, um, you're, you're forcing the students to, to work with what is important with the scene. So instead of, you know, going straight ahead and flying out of the gate with your, your monologue shots. Oh, and by, by the way, that's not just when you have silent acting shots. That's not like you go from um, Stewie is the character that has the, um, you know, just the eyeballs and Bishop has the bishop is the rig that you're familiar with, seen around the net and stuff. Um, it's you don't get bishop for your next silent acting shot. You get him when you have a monologue shot, and that is it's, it's frustrating to some students. But I actually think that it really emphasizes the importance of pantomime. So where where the students at Animation Mentor, for instance, are forced to really take the importance of silent acting uh, seriously force yourself so rather than busting out of the gate and going crazy and like oh i want to do all this stuff i want to i want to you know work on that and you can and i'm not saying like oh no don't do dialogue shots don't do this or that but what i'm saying is when you are working on your dialogue shots definitely acknowledge the importance of of pantomime okay 
Animators get carried away with new toys when the basics are more important. Another thing that uh, you know, you know, I see is when an animator is working on you know simple things like a bouncing ball, and then they move on to a pendulum, and then they have a bouncing ball with a tail, and they, or the you know a flower sack rig or something like that, where they're le le uh, learning the overlap and those kinds of concepts and whatever. Whenever an animator gets a new tool, they kind of forget what they are what they've learned and instead of adding that new concept or that new tool to their workflow and to you know the and, and letting it supplement the, the 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 workflow that they have already they kind of just like focused extremely on that thing so this is probably why and this probably um, can account for rather um, the the lack of really focus on on pantomime in animators because you have I even if you're starting out you can go to Creative Crash and you can get you know 25 30 really good rigs that have full face controls and you can be animating right out of the gate and it's very hard to resist the urge to 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 do that. Luckily, I didn't have that when I was learning, and uh, the, you know the only free rigs that were available were 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 absolutely god awful. And um, so, I mean, you, you you kind of had to make do with what you what you could do yourself. So, obviously, that forced me. So I was forced, and I know I'm asking a lot of you to not to not just you know go buck wild, but try to try to restrain yourself. Approach all your scenes as pantomime. This is the this is really the hinge of this uh, lecture right now. When you think of your scene as a as a silent acting scene, all of a sudden you'll realize how much of a crutch dialogue is, how much you are letting go of the fundamentals, how much you're skipping through those beats and phrases and not really clearly delineating those phrases with strong posing and body language. And you'll realize that your scenes as approached as pantomime are so much stronger than when you um, w when you don't approach them uh, thusly. Okay, so that's really the crux of this. So let's talk about some pantomime characteristics. Gotta get rid of that. Where's that mouse go? Here we go. Goodbye, mouse. Obviously, you know that it's 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 silent acting. It's acting without dialogue. So that's the the very you know simplest way to put it. And of course, um, it, it it goes without saying. But one thing that's important to note about saying that it's acting without dialogue is that it can be acting with with um, with sound. It can it can still be you know there can still be sound effects. There can still be grunts and and moans and groans and whatever. And so it's really to 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 an animator it's not it's 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 disconnecting that reliance on the spoken words and the meaning of the words to drive your pose choices okay so so uh, just think about it that way, even when you're approaching a dialogue shot. Remember, in the last slide, approach it as pantomime, and then all of a sudden you'll see that you're actually creating stronger poses and stronger work um, because of that. So acting without dialogue just means that we are not, we're not going to rely on the meaning of the word, r literally the definition of each word to, to influence our pose choices, which is very common. You know, I'm cold, you know, Man, it smells in here, right? Those kinds of things, all right? It's reliant on gestures to create your performance. Now, this is another thing that you'd say, like, okay, well, that's self-explanatory. But, you know, acting without dialogue turned out not to be self-explanatory. Reliant on gestures is not as is self explanatory as you would think it is. Because here's what I mean by that. We do we think of gestures as like what we're doing with our hands. But what I'm gonna to try to tell you in this lecture is to is to really uh resist that as well. Resist that urge. Make this a make this a your your new mantra to avoid all superfluous and meaningless small little, you know, hand gesticulating and those kinds of things. Because when you actually put it into the body, then what you'll find is that not only in clearly delineating those phrases with strongly held poses, that your body language is speaking the, the, the subtext of the scene so much stronger 
than those meaningless gestures ever would. So reliant on gestures, but reliant on full body gestures to create performance. Body language sets the undertone. That means that what you're doing is creating a palette, a, a baseline that the character comes through, the character is built upon with the body language. It all starts with body language, and body language is just a way of saying, using full body poses, head to toe posing, that has a, a contribution to the context of the scene, to the subtext of the scene, to the meaning of what the character is doing, and is so much stronger again, body language, than these meaningless little, you know, flippant uh, uh, wiggle hand things that you can ever do. Always, 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 okay? Timing and posing even more combative than in dialogue. Well, timing and posing are kind of like the, the you know, opposites. They're, they're the yin and yang of animation, if you think about it. All we have is basically, if you want to break it down into two things, time and pose. So, in pantomime, what we need to understand is that these two, you know, yin and yang are a little bit more diametrically opposed because of the lack of dialogue, okay? So when we rely on dialogue, normally we can get away with a lot more choices in, in the, the, the variety and the balance of timing and pose than if we don't. So if, for instance, if someone says like, wow, it's really cold in here, and you wanted to time that extremely slowly, there's some, there's some, you know, an effect that the audience has and the viewer has just from, from hearing that inflection in the, in the line, wow, it's really cold in here, that if you time it really slowly, it will still kind of read. Will it be as strong as it possibly can be? Absolutely not, but it'll still kind of read. And that's why dialogue is so dangerous, because it's so easy to rely on it. Wow, it's really cold in here. See, I took one pose, I went into it slowly, but it actually kind of reads a little bit. It, I would say it's about 10% of, the, of the, the full potential of that line. But, um, but there you go. So timing and posing are actually kind of just all there is with pantomime. Some more characteristics. A large majority of visual effects in game animation is is uh, pantomime. I would say that you know I, I say this a lot in the in the ask video mails that the um, and uh, that the, in animation there's a lot more jobs in like commercial VFX and commercial animation creature effects uh, creature animation in in um, film and and uh, television. And, you know, most of us are not working at Pixar on, you know, two-hour, you know, performance pieces. So a large amount of, of uh, uh, work is pantomime. So that just lends itself, uh, lends its weight behind the fact that you should really practice pantomime as its own art form and, and, and really get into it as, as, um, as powerful as it potentially can be. Dialogue gives the animator le a lot of leeway in performance choice. So again, that was what was kind of I was saying before about timing and posing being more combative in 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 pantomime. You just need to know that in with dialogue you have all of this extra leeway that the the audience will buy and it will it will probably pass off, but really are we all trying to just pass our animation off or are we trying to contribute? to the industry, contribute to the art form, and, and, and all be a part of something a little bit bigger here. And I, I, think, we all, I think we all feel the, you know, the latter. Workflow stays editable. Um, this is, I just had to put that in there. You know I'm a, a, a workflow freak. I, I think it's extremely important. So I'll talk a little bit later about workflow. Um, and I'll give you some tips actually stolen right from the workflow lecture. Uh, last or, or in August. Fundamentals are key. Fundamentals, not just the animation fundamentals, but your workflow fundamentals and the fundamentals of performance as a whole. So just t we'll just go over those. Pantomime is a medium. Um, here are a couple artists and I want to uh, show you some, some uh, uh, clips um, of, of these people, especially Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton. These are basically the um, 
I wouldn't say contemporary because you know they you know this you know their work is you know 60 years old, but they they are basically the modern form of pantomime as a visual medium. Um, these guys are like the the absolute you know masters masters of this um, this art. Obviously, because they worked in silent films, and it's weird to see Charlie Chaplin. I mean, Charlie Chaplin was in plenty of films where he spoke. Um, it's weird to see him speak um, because you're so good at pantomime, and so is Buster Keaton. Buster Keaton's been called the king of the deadpan, and you know, just like the the staring and, and getting just extreme amount of emotion in his face, basically doing nothing. Um, before I show you that, I'll just talk to you about Commedia dell'arte. Commedia dell'arte is basically um, theater in which there were basically a cast of characters and you would retell all of these stories that have the the different the, or the the same cast like the harlequin and and the and, and scaramouche and 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 these these different characters and they all have their own backstory and whatever and they all like you know if someone you know falls in love with an, with another then you know it's probably going to be these two characters or something like that but the thing about it is that it was very, very performance uh, based, very presentational, and a lot of the, a lot of the characters had these almost like signature poses. Like, you know, they, you know, throw a chicken into a machine and, you know, turn a crank and, you know, like a cooked chicken would come out the other end. It, like, that's like one of the gags. And, like, while you're waiting for it to, to pop out, like, there would be this these set poses, like these standard poses that would mean something. And so body language kind of was turned into symbols um, with that. And the same thing with Greek theater. Uh, in Greek theater, there wasn't, there wasn't, uh, you know, narrative threads the, the same way that we have them. They would have basically these story elements that were hobbled you know, hob together, and again, there was these set poses, you know, that would mean certain things, like, you know, like, oh, I, I, I can't take it anymore, and like, you know, appealing to the gods, and, and you know, st striking someone down, and stuff like that, and, and I'm part of the Greek theater, part of the interesting thing about that was that they all wore masks, and the masks would normally hide their face, and, you know, they would have a happy face or a sad face. Some people say that the masks were actually meant to amplify because uh, amplify their voices because it was almost like a, almost like a, holding a cone around your, your face, the, the way that the mouths were shaped. Um, so some people say that they actually had a utilitarian purpose, but at the same time, you, you can't argue the fact that, you know, the body language and the pose was extremely important to, you know, practice practitioners of pantomime, um, even back as far as ancient Greece. So let's watch a, a couple clips here. I think you're really going to enjoy these. These are all, uh, these are all um, ancient, so they're public domain. I wanted to, I was going to show some other ones, uh, that thing on uh, LA Times. Was it LA Times or New York Times? But it, it says 14 actors acting, and I, I I really liked that. It was mesmerizing to watch, um, and I had some I had some ideas about that that I want to talk about. But then I thought to myself, you know what? What if it's um, what if I get in trouble? What if it's not public domain? So here we go. Let's watch uh, let's watch this together. <laughs> I'm going to turn it down a little bit. So this is Charlie, Cheen, Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton. Buster's on the um, piano and, and Charlie is playing um, the violin. And these, this is, you know, later in their, their lives and their careers, of course. And I just like how much um, Charlie takes on these, these really nice poses that have um, just a lot of character in them and... and and stuff like that. So, let's see here. See, even that. See, I I, I love that. See, he takes us. He he's 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 
peeved because Buster is, um, you know, messing with his music. And instead of walking back and, you know, putting his hands on his hips and tapping his foot, look at the timing of him rapping on the on the piano with his with his violin bow. You know, it's really nice variety. It's not just like tap, 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 you know, evenly timed and boring. He puts it out there and, you know, really, really quickly raps on it. You know, that's one of the um, nice things about pantomime is that uh, when you have variety, you can have, you can you really do some really awesome stuff. And look at this. He's, his, um, his foot is too short. It's so good. All right, let's move on. It's just a thing. So beautiful. He uses a lot of takes to the camera as well. He uses a lot of um He uses a lot of, you know, looking at, looks at the camera and, and you know, um, a lot of facial expression as well. See? And what, a, what an interesting choice right there. Instead of, you know, stepping on it like he did before, this time he puts the fiddle bow between his legs and lifts it up like, you know, like as if that wouldn't do absolutely nothing. So you check it out. Rip. Absolutely amazing. You know, masterful in terms of the the, the pose choice and the and the animation choice. If this were an animation, um, that's why these guys are so good. Extends it again. Let's just watch this skip to the end. I think that the, the 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 most important thing to glean from watching reference like that is that the characters um first and foremost are always looking for variety. They're never looking for the, the obvious choice. You know, he could have slipped on anything and fallen over the edge right there. He could have done uh, any number of things to, to fall off the stage. But instead, you know, he did this really, you know, very cartoony wind up and slip and then he went over his back off of the stage. You know, that, you know, right off the bat you have, you have, you know, uh, um, a human, an actor, like a, a living, breathing human being, who instead of you know the obvious, always goes with the with the with the most variety. Here's a movie called The Kid. Here's just an excerpt from from the film, um, and uh, this is Charlie Chaplin. This is very, very classic Chaplin. And the kid is very good in this too. Choosing his rocks. Look at that. As if he doesn't notice. See, how funny was that? You know, his his body language, is, it's all body language. Look, he approaches and then he's like, hmm, well, I'm not gonna, I'm, in, I'm of no use here. And then he keeps on walking. 
You know, it, that, that's all body language. It's unmistakable what he's trying to do right here, right? Unmistakable. Oh, a window. Oh, oh yeah. Can I? You want me to fix this? Oh, sure, I can fix this. Right, please. Great stuff. Look at the little shuffling that he does. I love that. It's so adorable the little shuffling that he does, but it's great it's great um it's great pantomime. You know, you can tell he's you know, really embarrassed. Right? You might do, if you're an animator, you might have a really standard kind of pose where you're like, oh, gee, shucks, I'm, you know, I got caught, and you might be hunched over. But look how this kid, you know, this is a fantastic choice. I wonder if he was given this choice or if this is, this is kind of how it was done back then. But when he's caught, he, this little kicking that he does and shifting back and forth is just beautiful for pantomime. <laughs> and the cop thinks it's great. He's like, aha, uh -huh. he was the one who was breaking it. Okay, so see if you can tell what's going on right here. So the cop sees him fixing the window and kind of gets it that um, this guy's in on the deal. And um, see if you can see, uh, tell from Charlie Chaplin's body language exactly what uh, he's what he's feeling w you know, with the cop and when the woman comes out. Right? So he takes the money from the lady, the cop doesn't like it, and and he just does this little gesture where he's like just getting his arms just putting his arms out. It's not like he's not really actually doing anything towards Charlie, but Charlie gets the idea instantly. He knows like, oh geez, alright, fine, alright, I'm not gonna charge her, here you go, and he gives the money back. Watch again. So it looks like the cop is uh, is trying to put his um, hands on his hips, and he's kind of just you know, you know, putting his arms straight out so his his um, what do you call these wrist uh, cuffs are not you know he's pulling them back and then he's putting his hands on his and on his hips. Charlie's scared by that first action anyway, just by that those hands uh, being you know put out. So it's just really 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 nice body language right here on Charlie Chaplin's part. Now this is the this is so funny. I love this. So the kid's like, "Hey, where are we going next?" <laughs> Just awesome. So um you know, those guys those guys really started it all for, in, in terms of film for for sure, for sure. Okay, so so those are the characteristics that we are uh, just going to um, deal with, and we're going to use that that understanding, that definition, to um, start talking about animation. So to translate your influences, let's just start start first and foremost. It's obviously you you don't copy your your influences when we talk about making. Video reference. One thing that's very dangerous with video, video reference for pantomime is that you can't really think of everything at the exact same time. So you probably are best off creating more than one video reference for your pantomime shots. And then pick and choosing the things you like from each one that you want to include in your animation. So if it's someone, you know, sneaking up to a cupboard and then opening it up and then seeing if anyone is around 
and then stealing the cookies and then walking off. You know, you probably want to do that over and over and over again and focus on and, and think in your head as you're doing it about just one small certain section. Just one little section. Okay? And 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 in that section what is most important to you the pose the timing and then again just just compile it all together when you're done and and really overshoot video reference for pantomime okay because again when it comes down to it a we're just humans we can't like oh what does my pose look like what does my silhouette look like right now oh my god wait what, did I take that step too fast? Oh, the timing is all off now. Or I'm opening it up. Oh, wait, sorry, wrong way. Reaching. Uh, how much anticipation? Oh, I'm off my timing again. See, it just falls apart and there's way too much to think about. Just relax. Take a deep breath. Really try to embody the character and then just do it over and over and over again, thinking about one small part. That small part you're thinking about is a phrase. All right. A lot of people have problems like, what's a beat? What's a phrase? How do I know when it's a new phrase? How do I know this and that? And the, the answer is, is that it's pretty much like one thing that you can think about as you're doing your video reference. So it's like one, one certain idea, right? So um, walking up to the cupboard is one phrase. And then opening the cupboard door would be another phrase. And then reaching in and grabbing the cookies would be another phrase. And then turning and leaving would be another phrase. Okay? And you make your 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 best effort to make sure that you're only focusing on one basically idea or phrase as you're shooting your video references uh, uh, as you can. And 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 don't copy. Certainly don't copy one take of video reference. But also don't copy the the video reference that you find on online or, or whatever. Okay? Realism is an issue in film and games and, and what this kind of makes us have to do or have to consider is that when you're making pantomime animation for for these uh, genres, you have to be very specific about your 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 pose and timing choices. All right. That doesn't mean that you can't you can't approach a dialogue shot as a pantomime shot like I, I've already recommended you do. It doesn't mean that you can't take all of these other fundamentals. What it just means is that mostly timing and posing are going to be um, um, those choices are not going to be as free as with um, other genres. Okay. So so. Um, you know, film, especially, you know, realistic feature film, um, especially if you're doing something like digidoubles, um, which, which are 3D characters that are, um, that are supposed to replace actors when they don't have, when they don't have a shot of that actor. So, you know, crewmen walking along the ship, you know, the, the, the deck of the Black Pearl in parts of the Caribbean, for instance, right? Um, you know, astronauts floating outside, uh, you know, the ship in, in Avatar, for instance, although they probably would mocap that. But, um, you know, you just can't get away with it as much pantomime, right? So that astronaut, you're not going to have him, you know, take out his wrench and put it on the bolt and, uh, and uh, right? You're going to have him do something more realistic, aren't you? So... Timing is harder with pantomime. Is the result. So in the in the in the in the war between posing and timing, timing is going to lose. Timing loses because we have very little to go on. How how much how how long of an anticipation is the correct amount of anticipation? Okay, how long should a character take to cross the cross the kitchen to make it to the cupboard to steal those cookies? Right? These are very difficult questions. I'll, um, I'll show you a little trick on how to, uh, how to deal with that. Keep your workflow loose and editable. I, I always say that for everything. Okay? Body mechanics and physics can overshadow performance, especially when realism is a, is a problem. So um, I'll talk in a second about how to, um, what fundamentals to focus on to help you out of you know, normal pantomime problems. Texture comes in when you start making your shot, well, obviously te it, oh, texture always comes in to play when we t t start talking about polishing your shot and making it a little bit more than just a, you know, a blocked kind of you know, beat-to-beat, pose-to-pose kind of action. But 
texture in pantomime actually can serve the purpose of making it so that your, your pantomime is very multi-leveled, very multi-meaning. And, and uh, that is so important in pantomime because we don't want the, the people to seem like that what they're doing at that exact moment is the only thing that they are, are, can possibly do. Right? So you watch like carpenter ants like go up, walk up to a piece of wood and chew the wood and the splinter breaks off and they turn around and they walk it back to the, the hill. Right? And from watching that, you say to yourself, like, wow, that's the only thing that they can do. And it looks like the only thing they can do. They're, like, built for it. They're, they're machines, basically living machines, and that's it. So we don't want our animation without texture to look like the character is built for opening up cupboards, stealing cookies, and leaving. Although it's a good place to start, that that what I just performed, that clear delineated pose, and those um, those very distinct phrases is a great place to start. That's not where we want to end, and and texture helps us out. And then the fundamentals. Again, I'll tell you which fundamentals are are, are important. Um, a word about planning. Thumbnails are probably the most important tool that you can use. Um, I, I was I was. I've always been hesitant to tell people that they need to learn how to draw because I know plenty of successful animators who can't draw a straight line, but the industry is changing and the fact of the matter is is that, you know, with so much talent entering the industry recently, um, you you got to know that someone is as good or better an animator than you and they can draw, right? So there's really no... Um, no um, excuse anymore for, for, for not being able to like literally draw a straight line. Thumbnails are extremely important for vis visual communication. Thumbnails make it so that you can um, show a director or show your supervisor exactly what you want to do. So thumbnails are extremely important, but where, where, where thumbnails will help you is as you're moving into the later stages of your, of your animation, your blocking plus and your polish, it'll be, serve as kind of a buoy Something that you can look at and say, like, oh, this is my original thought. I want to stay close enough to that where it still feels like that. You might not, you might, you know, come off the thumbnails um, a little bit, but it's really nice to have just like kind of that buoy or that that lighthouse that can kind of steer you and keep you in track with what you were thinking in terms of contributing to the scene with pose and with body language as you make the timing work with with pantomime, which is again more more difficult. Thumbnails are most important. Storyboards are what you get that are kind of the shot. Um, one frame that kind of is indicative of the entire shot. Storyboards are not as as helpful for pantomime because normally they're not like a pose to pose kind of breakdown. It normally just shows kind of the main action. So storyboards are not as important. Acting it out. Acting it out just means acting it out without a camera. This is very, very um, beneficial. If you don't have a video camera to take reference, you stil still should be getting up out of your chair, moving around, and trying it out. When you are acting out pantomime, the most important thing to remember, again, is that you are not trying to um, uh, think of everything at once. Break it down into a phrase, and if it's just like the grabbing of the cookie jar, maybe you'll have him have his hands right here, and they'll burst out, and they'll grab it, and they'll bring it back to his chest. Maybe you'll have him like with the fingers and then grab it. Maybe you'll have him look all around and whoop, grab it with one hand and bring it back to his, his body like this. So all of these things, and you don't need a camera to try these out because you are just doing your, your, your thought exploration. You're just brainstorming ideas um, at this point. So I do want to say that acting it out is beneficial. If you don't have a camera, you're, you can still do a lot to, to plan your scene. Reference video is just acting out with video, and the same rules apply. One thing at a time, really, with pantomime, okay? That doesn't mean that when you're shooting a reference video, you shouldn't go through the entire shot, all right? The entire shot will come together, and, and, and it'll feel natural to perform the whole thing. You don't need to worry about that. But what I would say is that in, in, instead of just trying to do a, a one perfect take. Just go through it over and over and over again, focusing on one thing at a time. Posing. Uh, force. Uh, dynamic life drawing for animators. I think that's the subtitle. 
Uh, I have both these books. These are amazing in terms of developing a, a visual shorthand for yourself. Um, believe it or not, some drawings have so much dynamic force in them that the drawing alone will give you all the timing information you need. Okay, Bridgman's is, is better for learning how to draw a, a, a strong silhouette, a dynamic silhouette, whereas force is much more uh, about the, the forces in a body and forces in a drawing. So I really recommend these two if you want to improve your thumbnailing and you want your thumbnails to actually give you back a lot of information. I, I, I recommend these two, okay? So we'll start tackling the issues of pantomime that I was discussing. Timing is harder with pantomime. So how do we get past that? Use inner monologue as a timing tool. Okay? Use inner monologue as a timing tool. So what that means is when we have a character and they're acting out, what they are, are doing is basically taking motions and stringing them together. Now, some of these have thoughts behind them. And that's, that, that's kind of how it is. So like, for instance, that character who's standing there and looking around, making sure no one is, is looking at, at them. You probably, in that moment, thought to yourself, wait, I should wait and see if anybody is looking at me. Now, that is the inner monologue for that action. Now, some of actions don't have it. But you can create inner monologue that works, okay? So good pantomime has distinct beats and phrases, and we know that, and we want to we get there. We want to get to that point where our pan all of our pantomime does, okay? So because dialogue, dialogue naturally follows rhythmic patterns, and it's so easy to time dialogue, hey, you, get out! What would that be? Hey, you, get out! You know, you how would you do that differently, right? And if you bro if you broke that, you you would pro it would probably look weird, right? Hey, you get out! That is so weird to look at, or or the opposite. Hey, you get out! Like the opposite way. It's so weird to look at it when it doesn't work with the natural beats and rhythms. So the old masters would sit with, you know, a couple key frames and a stopwatch and in their head time that out. They would use their stopwatch over and over and over and then would look at what they want their poses to achieve and then they would just time it out using a stopwatch, you know, on the on the first page. And refer to that and and and, and you know, draw their key poses with the with the correct frame numbers um, you know, circled in the corner. And that is what we need to start doing with our pantomime. So create a line of dialogue that is actually the character's inner monologue. So some actions already have them. So when you, the character is here and they're looking around, that there's already a piece of inner monologue there. I better make sure that no one's looking at me. Right? Here's the trick. Instead of just using that straight up timing of that inner monologue, you um, infuse the, the rhythm of a piece of dialogue that is kind of more describing the action. Okay? So they're going to be, let's, let's say that we're going to expand the action just a little bit. They're going to be reaching and stop and then look left and, and look right. All right? So if you want this to to be timed um, interestingly, then come up with an inner monologue that maybe is like this. I'm going to reach, but wait, maybe I should look right and look left. All clear. All right. So that would be the, minor, the inner monologue for that. So you, as you noticed there, I was basically really just, just describing the actions as they, as they happen, and I'm using the timing that I want to have in the final dialogue, all right? And then I have a perfectly, perfectly clear guide to follow in order to make my pantomime timed the way that I want it to be timed. And I would say that you can even use, you can even record it 
and put it on the timeline, and that would not be cheating. And up here it says, use the implied phrasing to help you time the animation, and that's the phrasing from the monologue that you had, right? And if you want, you can even record it and put it on the timeline. The old masters, they'd have a stopwatch, and they would write down on their, on their animation, you know, what they were you know, what they were seeing on their stopwatch. So is that cheating? Because they were, you know, using a stopwatch to, and, you know, not counting frame numbers in their head? No. If you want to record that inner monologue and then animate to that on the timeline, then that's fantastic. The reason that that is different and it's not cheating and it's not, like, I, I said, like, oh, well, dialogue gives us so much and, and, and you're, you're cheating if you're using dialogue. Well, the difference is, is that the dialogue, we rely it to convey the meaning because we rely on the definition of the word and the context of the words themselves and not on, just on our really, really, really strong posing. Okay, that's a problem because it, um, pantomime does not have that. And so when we use a piece of inner monologue, we are still avoiding the pitfall of letting the words themselves speak the meaning, and we're just getting timing help. All right, and be be very specific. Right, like I'm stopping. And I'm going to reach, but wait, maybe I should look right, and maybe I should look, okay, something, something like that. And don't be afraid to, to, to look like a fool. Your animation will be so good. Anyone who thinks that you're, you're, you look stupid, you'll catch them the next day, you know, in the break room recording themselves uh, doing it. I promise you that, okay? So... Use inner monologue as a timing tool. Accessing subtlety. With pantomime, we all want it to be really, you know, subtle, really impressive, small movements and small gestures and stuff like that. But the last thing I said is the, is the biggest pitfall. We all want to have this subtlety, but we think that it has to be small gestures. Little flicks of the fingers and wrists and arms and, and, and you know, doing stuff with the, with the eyebrows and the, and, the, and the face and really just relying on these small tools that have cliched symbols built into them. Like that way. You know, literally pointing to the direction that you want to go. Okay? So the way you fix this is you start using some of these fundamentals that have subtlety built into them. Anticipation is thought. That's Eric Goldberg's quote. Uh, he's right about that. He's a genius on this, on this subject, and I'm going to convey some of that to you in a second. Posing conveys meaning, not small gestures. Posing conveys meaning. Timing conveys mood. So let's talk about these. Um, first of all, anticipation is thought. Eric Goldberg likes to say this, and he's totally right about this. I feel like I'm stealing his phrase, but we all we all benefit from it. So I think he'll I think he'll be okay with that. Anticipation is thought. Anything that you are thinking about, you're going to really anticipate. Why? Because you're preparing for that moment. It's not just visual preparation for the audience, so that you don't lose them when that really quick action just starts happening. That's not all anticipation is. It's actually that thought. So if I'm going to punch that person and I really want to hurt them badly, I'm going to wind up and I'm going to hit them. I'm going to clock them. But if I'm the person being punched, you know, I'm turning here and then all of a sudden, boom, I'm going to get hit. No anticipation on my impact. And that makes sense because anticipation is pre-action, basically, and, and when you get hit, it's reaction. So that is the, 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 the way that we normally think about it as animators, and we kind of rely on the simplicity of that definition when there's so much more that can be done with it. Long anticipation is more thought. Short anticipation, more unconscious, more a, a subconscious movement or something that someone's not thinking about or planning. So look at that. You can just use anticipation to really um, put together a, a very subtle scene. A character looking out from behind a wall. Slow anticipation, he's aware and thinking he knows he shouldn't be seen. He is careful. Quick anticipation. He's reactive. He's reckless. He's unaware of danger and assesses the situation on the go. So I'm talking about like a soldier behind a wall. All right, let's say there's a wall right here. You can see me just so that you can see me. 
okay? And over here, there's some, some bad guys, right? I'm going to try to do this performance with the exact same kind of same action on the end, but just two different anticipations, okay? So, so I'm looking out, and I'm a soldier with my gun, all right? First is the slow anticipation, and the second is the quick anticipation. Okay, now the quick. All right, to me, clear as day. Again, this, the, the slow anticipation is I can't be seen, I can't any strategy, etc. The other guy just wants to stick his head out and see what's going on. And, and you know, if there's bad guys over there, well, fine, I'll, I'll deal with it. If I see bad guys, I'll, I'll shoot at them, right? All from the different timing of the anticipation. We're going to try to do it one more time. And I'm try, I'm, again, I'm trying to make, keep the action itself of looking out the same timing. So let's try it one more time. Okay. To me, clear as day. There is so much subtlety available in anticipation. And those are just two extremes. In between those two extremes that I just showed you, there's an entire spectrum of the amount of thought and, 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 and precognitive, you know, uh, subtlety that you can build into a scene. And, and, and it's all available to you. There's, n there's no trick, there's no thing to, to, to uh, obstacle to get over, no hurdle to jump before you can start doing this. This is something you can start right now doing with your work. Is starting to use this fundamental as it's as it's meant to be. Okay. Posing. We talked about posing uh, a, a second ago before the um, before the anticipation. And in pose, the interesting thing is that you make a a small gesture uh, like a little cliche, and you subtle. What you're actually being is very obtuse. You're being so symbolic and cliche with your with your gestures. Um, I've heard it from one of my students who said their mentor, I can't remember who it is, uh, I, I'd credit them if I could, that their mentor said that you are doing sign language posing. Or, or was it traffic cop? It was, it was sign language or traffic cop posing? You know, because a traffic cop has to be so clear. You know, you come, you turn, right? You stop. All of these, these have to be basically unmistakable. Because what happens if they screw up and there's any, you know, room for interpretation of that gesture? Then someone's going to get into a car accident. Okay? So with these little gestures that you're doing, and all the all the the wrist wiggling and the and the finger movement, subtlety doesn't mean small bones are moving or small small objects or 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 things are moving only a little bit. Subtlety means dialing into the power of pose to make sure that your body language is is speaking the scene, the meaning of the scene, and not those those sign languages. Okay, so full body gestures convey the meaning convey it with a softer touch. I giggled when I wrote that. <laughs> Soft touch. Okay. So I like to say head to toe posing. A full body gesture means that the entire body is changing from one pose with clear body language to another pose with clear body language. So if I'm really excited about what I'm going to get from Santa and then I don't really like what I got, you know, that would be a full body gesture. And you would think that it's, okay, very you know, th th that's very natural to, to see, Kenny, and, and I do that all the time. However, you'd be surprised if you go back and look at your work how little th there is a clear body language change between the, the, the phrases of your animation when your character is going through a very wild character arc. Okay, especially in dialogue, if you've, d if you've done a lot of dialogue work. So using full body gestures is all you need to convey the, the, the real meaning behind that, that um, scene. Body language speaks volumes. I don't think there's any arguing that. Um, when you know, a character is 
Um, I like to use this example a lot. Character, you know, do I want to, you know, I'm going to go over there. Okay, I'm going to go over there. Is that as as powerful as, you know, using the body language to actually show that they're interested in maybe going over there? Right? That That small little gesture is so much more powerful than you know, this big, what you think is, oh, that's so clear. I'm pointing, boom, that's where I want to go. That's clear, all right? And then oh, I want to go over there. Well, your body language is not telling me that you want to go over there, but all of a sudden, I want to go over there. You're moving towards it. You're kind of like moving as much as you can without lifting your foot. It's almost like I'm strained. I really want to go over there, but I'm planted right here. All this subtlety, I could go on and on about, you know, what that little performance, that just qu really quick performance I just did implies about this character that I've never even met and I've never even thought about just from what I just did. Okay. Leave the small gestures for secondary. So if you really want to do small gestures, that's great, but you should do them with secondary action. Okay. Character is, is talking to someone and you want to have them gesticulating. You know what? Have them doing something with their hands, you know, going through their, their, if you're doing a, a test, obviously if you're working on a film or something and there, there's, you know, an action been given to you, you have to do that, but, you know, if you're just working on 11 second club test or something like that, give your character a secondary action. Maybe they're, they're looking for directions or, or they're talking to somebody and they're, they're going through their wallet. You know, you want that little, those little micro gestures, you want to show you can w use your hands and use your fingers and do those small little gestures, that's great. Put that on top of body language, you know, actually showing, you know, pride and, and depression and, and, you know, awkwardness and, and all these things. And then you have a multi-layered, multi-leveled scene. So leave the secondary, or leave the small gestures for secondary. Okay, if you really want to access the subtlety in in pantomime, okay, um, there is a there is a secondary lecture that um, I'm trying to get up into the shop. I'm trying to get all the lect the old lectures up into the shop so you can still download them. But um, it takes a while because I am not a programmer. Animating and programming are very two very very different things. I, I never would have thought. And then timing, I said it conveys mood. Instead of having one timing choice, use a variety. Okay? We all know that variety is really important, but normally we only do like, kind of like uh, I would call a variety pass on our animation, especially for doing things like untwinning things that are, that are too close to each other in, in, in terms of pose and, and untwinning um, certain timings that uh, are, are too similar. Okay, so even if, you know, like one hand comes up and goes like this and the other hand um, drops down and goes like this, you know, you don't want them completely twinned like that in terms of timing. So it's rather than doing a timing variety pass, really plan for that variety. Okay, so um, vary your timing for in one example according to the energy. All right, not just how the the character, what the characters are doing, but the actual timing choices for those actions. Okay, so one idea is a character is nervous, then animate them very very twitchy. So really quick pose to pose actions. The 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 example kind of against this is like P.T. Flea, for example. If P.T. Flea from Bugs Life, you know, bouncing all around. If he was any other character, rather than a flea, then it wouldn't make much sense, would it? But fleas jump and bounce around. They're, they're instant. They're all over, where, all, all over the place. And they gave him the personality to match. So they're, um, um, these all seem like natural choices as well. And what I try to do with these lectures is, kind of, is point out what the thought process is but, but behind all of these natural ideas that you're probably having. And so that you can make it part of your workflow instead, instead of just happening upon like a really good timing for one shot. And then, you know, someone comes along and says, hey, that was great. What you did on that one shot. Can you do it on this shot? D you know, being being pretty much out of luck, 
I wanted to make sure that everyone knows why you have these ideas in the beginning and how to continue to have great ideas like this as you go on. So if you're going, the character is nervous and twitchy, you might think that they might, they might be doing nervous and twitchy things, but even if they are making themselves a cup of coffee, even if they're you know, opening a drawer, even if they're tying their shoes, all of these things can be just a little bit of variety in that timing, and that speaks volumes through subtlety. A character falling in love, you know, a character, you know, you might have a, um, even like a walk cycle, you know, how easy it is to vary the, 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 just the timing of the walk cycle when he, you know, all of a sudden starts falling in love, you know, really swinging his arms and really, you know, taking these, you know, nice slow steps with really like, like hitched passing poses you know, right there. That's all you need when you're talking about accessing the subtlety with pantomime in a way that doesn't have a, a destructive effect to, to the idea of the scene. It's not like you have to have a new, brand new performance choice. You can just use just variety and timing, for, for example. I think there's one more idea. Character is happy or, um, or sad. Same thing. Um, using the energy of the scene. Okay, to to dictate that that all this all of this does tie in to the inner monologue. So if a character is nervous and doesn't want to get caught, then use your use your you know the power of the inner monologue to 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 make sure that the, it matches that it has that same kind of quality to it. Like oh, uh, uh, I might get caught. Uh, well, maybe, 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 maybe I should r run out of here. Something like that. I don't know. That was a, a crook who's who's having second thoughts about robbing a bank or something. I don't know. I make these up on the spot. They're not going to be, you know, they're not going to be that deep. Okay. <laughs> um, so that's tackling the subtlety issue. Use the fundamental approach. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow through this because this, does, um, this is covered in the workflow, um, the workflow lecture that uh, I, I have already done. Um, let me make sure you can see this. Hold on a second. Yeah, okay. I'm just going to really quickly um, blow through this. Use the fundamental approach. Okay. The fundamental approach is basically this. Simply, you have your fundamentals. You've seen all these. You know all these questions, stretch, anticipation, staging, straight ahead action, all this stuff. You know about this. What the fundamental approach is, is taking those fundamentals and use those fundamentals to build your scene. Start thinking of your scene as a, a assemblage. Do I have that uh, word here? An assemblage of the fundamentals rather than like a scene where it's like a very high concept thing um, that, you know, the, this, this human being, this biped or, or whatever, really has to um, go and achieve. Start thinking of your scene as, for instance, all about that anticipation. If, it's, if, your, scene, if your pantomime scene is a, a character, you know, really thinking about, you know, his family before he runs into battle, then there's going to be a huge amount of anticipation. So that means thinking about anticipation as one of the fundamentals of your scene. So it's kind of like, you know, you have a bench, like, a, like on a, a sports team, and you're like, okay, here's my shot. It's a soldier. He's running out, and he really thinks about it because, you know, he's got a, 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 a newborn baby at home or whatever. And you're like, okay, anticipation, you're up. And you're like, oh, boy, coach, thank you. All right, get in there. Um, let's see here. Um... Uh, let's see what else. Straight ahead action, pose to pose. Uh, you're going to sit this one out. All right. We're going to we're going to go with uh, anticipation. So what I'm saying is, if you add your fundamentals to your blocking, you can save a lot of time by not having to make really um, gross changes to the scene, because then what part of that animation becomes to you is really just adjusting that fundamental. So if you get a very high level note. Um, on your shot, very, very, very high level, like, you know, it, he doesn't look like he's, you know, scared enough before he runs out there. Can you make it just like look like he's a, thinking about it a little bit more? Well, you're going to know because you built that scene with that anticipation as the fundamental that's accessing that subtlety of that scene, that that's the only thing you need to adjust. Really, that's it. And you can make 
very high level changes very quickly using that mindset. Okay? So I had a friend who every single shot, every single note that he got on every single shot he ever animated, he would have to basically go back to his desk and almost reblock the entire thing. With the fundamental approach, even if he was told, all right, that soldier doesn't look you know, freaked out enough. Like, can you make him kind of look a little bit more like he's, you know, really scared to go into battle? Then all this, all this animator would have had to do is go back to his desk, just find that, you know, those two main poses where that anticipation is really defined, and just sp spread them out just a little bit more, and maybe just make it a, a higher degree. So that big, long anticipation becomes even bigger and even longer, and it looks like he's thinking about it even more. That's just one example. I, uh, I hope you've been reading this. Um, because I don't want to do too much, like, you know, re-going over things in, in two different lectures, but this is actually very important to pantomime. So falling back on the fundamentals is what I just described. It's easier to imagine a single fundamental adjusted than an entire scene. So you use fundamental adjustment to use... Uh, to, to hit notes and to adjust your work. So knowing that the variety and the timing is what's making your character look like he's sad going to happy. The, the, the variety in the, um, or, or the amount of anticipation is how much he's thinking or how you're using body language to convey that overall meaning instead of the little micro gestures. So if you get a, if you get a, um, a note, oh, he doesn't look like he's in love enough then you don't have to worry about, you know, redoing all this animation where he's, you know, tying a ribbon on a, on a, on a present. All you have to do is make that body language, you know, make him, you know, kind of a little bit more kind of loosey-goosey in his spine and maybe, you know, when he, when, like, the girl walks by or something like that. Just trying to imagine scenes here. So fundamental adjustment is the quickest way to hit those, those notes. And um, avoid making performance changes as much as you can because unless you actually get a performance change, a, a performance note, that's not what you're being asked to do. So this is really important to remember for fixing your fundamentals. And this helps you obviously avoid reblocking. Dialogue as pantomime. The best dialogue shots work as good with work as well. What is that? Oh, wait, uh, 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 crap. Um, work as well with the sound off. So approach all of your work as pantomime. When you get a dialogue shot, turn off the, the, the uh, obviously listen to the dialogue over and over and over and over. I'll try to get all that subtext and all that meaning. But then f use body language to convey the subtext of the scene. Use secondary if you want to have little micro gestures that you can um, manipulate and change and, and sort of like color and tune to make it feel like it's supporting that body language. And then use things like variety and timing and uh, really strong pose and uh, things like you know anticipation as thought, for instance, to create the, the multi-layered, multi-leveled shot even before you turn that dialogue back on. Okay, so look at, um, I can't show it because I don't have the rights to it, but look at any one of your favorite Pixar uh, 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 films, look at any one of the, your favorite shots in that film and with the sound off, and you'll be able to see that you can tell, oh, he's angry at him, oh, he just said something that made him angry at him back, oh, and it hurt his feelings, actually, oh, no, well, he's going to leave. Uh, now he regrets it for saying it. He's thinking about following. Oh no, he's not going to follow him. Oh, he thought. Oh, he is going to follow him. So all of those, all of those things that are about to happen, you you absolutely can tell without even hearing the dialogue. And that's the problem with you know just a lot of um, new animators out there is is the is hearing the dialogue and thinking like, oh wow, well I'm really going to access all the subtext of the scene. I'm really going to make this scene you know feel super fantastic. I can't wait to get started. I can't wait to do it. And then you know first thing you do in my is go to the face cam and start moving the mouth. You know, absolutely backwards approach to way it should be done. So use this fact to judge your shots. Judge your dialogue as a pantomime shot. This is good for repeat practice. You actually um, are kind of approaching a pantomime shot and a dialogue shot when you are doing it this way. So you actually get repeat practice. You're, you're improving your pantomime as well as your dialogue. 
rely on feedback. Don't just look at it yourself. You really need to rely on feedback, especially when you're going to mute your sound and show it to somebody. Rely on the feedback because you've heard the line. Okay, and that's going to really influence what you think is being conveyed by the body language and by those that subtlety in the in the timing and posing and, and the gesturing. Okay, whereas someone who hasn't heard that sound, that piece of dialogue, is going to be so valuable to you. So without the sound, show it to a colleague or to a friend or, or, or upload it to a forum and say, hey guys, can you tell me what you think is going on in this scene? And if they say like, wow, this person won the lottery, but they found out that, you know, their their, their best friend, um, you know, stole their lottery ticket at the same time. And also there's a foul smell in the room. If that's exactly what's going on, you did it. You rocked it. And your dialogue, your facial performance and the, and the lip sync on top of that is going to make it gorgeous. But if it's a scene about a person um, not knowing how to make a recipe for a wedding cake, then you're in trouble. So rely on feedback. Really rely on it. Lean on, on, on people for feedback with your pantomime. Lay viewers are just as valuable as animators and sometimes better. Don't just show it to animators. Show it to your mom, your dad, your friends, your, your, your uh, dentist, your uh, oral hygienist, uh, and, and anywhere else you want to go outside of a medical office building. Okay? Secondary is the key. This is another thing that I am going to kind of zoom through because I do have an entire lecture based on secondary action. Um, but I do just want to um, repeat this um, just a little bit. All those little gestures you're doing, like flipping your arms around and all that little stuff, that has a place and that's secondary. Secondary action is always happening. We're always doing something with our hands. We're always busy. We're never talking about what we're doing. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm talking to you. I'm continuing to talking to you right now and I'm taking a drink of water. So that's how you, you um, access, if, if you want to do all those little gestures, that's fine. And there are small gestures that are really important sometimes, you know, uh, that, that characters can do. But you are much better off keeping your characters doing something secondary that has a, a, a way to contribute to the performance. Use secondary as an informed choice, meaning make it, show, make it so that all of your secondary choices have a contribution to make. So if someone is, you know, describing something, maybe they're, they're drawing a glass out with a rag, and they're describing something, and, and they get to the part... <sighs> that really makes them sad, and then they go back to what they were doing, you can tell exactly where the thoughts are going just by the timing of that secondary. Okay, I go very deep into it into the secondary lecture, so um, if you're interested in that, you should check it out. Improv comes in handy for this. <clears throat> One way you can make it so that your secondary is, is, is natural is actually try to improv the line or improv you know, a, a new line um, using the secondary that you, um, you've you chosen. So if it's cleaning a rag and you have that shot that I just described, go on. Go on, imagine more and more and more. Well, um, I'll have you know that uh, my son is the new quarterback. So I went from, you know, just normal speed. I sped it up when I said, I'll have you know that my son is the new quarterback. And I then I started almost like instead of drawing it, almost polishing it, like I'm polishing a quarterback, a, a football trophy or something. So just these little, tiny little um, informed choices make so much of a difference for your pantomime, for the subtext coming through the scene. And you can, um, you can find so many great ways to, to play with your secondary by just improv. Just stand up and, and do the secondary and, and run through, a, a, through you know, the gamut of, of scenes. Improving your shot. Variety, timing to get your natural texture. Variety in pose choices to avoid cliches. Variety in, in non-performance texture. Using that anywhere you can, what that basically means is dirtying up your keys. Okay, variety is the spice of life, and if your keys are way too clean, like I said, way in the beginning of this lecture, then it's going to look like, you know, it's an ant, a, a carpenter ant marching to, to, to chop some, some wood, right? So definitely a little bit of, 
a little bit of texture in all of your poses and all of your arcs is, is going to be in, in uh, very valuable. Stepped key danger. <clears throat> uh, check out the Ask video mail. I think it's either last week or the week before. It talks about um, using uh, stepped keys and how to avoid um, your animation going from from you know really nice looking to soup when you go to spline, and that's the stepped key danger. Refresh your shot by delineating phrases and simplifying curves. I deal in Animation Mentor with a lot of students with shots that have a lot of work on them. When I start actually going back and renewing the, the emphasis on, on pantomime, in order to make your shot work a lot better, normally what you have to do is go into the shot, pick two clear spots where there is a, you know, a definitely two different phrases and really like key that key it all, really push the poses, delete everything in between, and really make those poses held and stuck, and then make a very simple transition. What you'll what you're going to do is you're going to go back to very kind of like staccato, um, very kind of um, kind of you know super pose to pose animation. But it's so much easier to take a fundamental approach from from that point than it is to from from splined animation. So what I'm trying to say is that sometimes you need to take a step backwards to take a step forwards. And if you don't have very delineated phrases to start from, then probably your idea is a little lost. And that's a point when you can look at your thumbnails. If you are drawing thumbnails, I know you're you're still sitting here and you're reading and you're listening to the lecture, so you haven't gone off and, and, and started learning how to draw yet. But when you do, and I hope you do, then the thumbnails are a great time to get those back, or, or this is a great time to get the thumbnails back out. Okay? So um, before we wrap up, let me show you a just a, a scene that I did here. And this scene has um, just a little bit of animation. I uh, didn't get too far on it, but um, I definitely felt like it was going somewhere. So this is a character um, is supposed to be. It's supposed to be Kramer from Seinfeld, and we all know this character, so it's really easy to to figure it out. Okay, so the idea was he is busting into the scene, and he sees something over here. I don't even have it on the on the table yet. He sees something over here, and he's going to um, grab it. Okay, so it's a lot like the scene I described to you um, a second ago. So he busts in the way that Kramer normally does, and he's looking left and looking right. So when I had this, when I started creating this scene, I thought to myself, "All right, I'm just going to create my inner monologue. It's just going to be, poof, ah, look left, look right. Oh, there it is. I think I will take some." So it it kind of had like a little bit of that swing in the in the in the um, in the timing of it. So as I moved on, that was the first pass of layout. Here's my second pass of layout. Okay, so there's actually an object here now, all right, and it's still on stepped keys. So, poof. Ah, look left, look right. Ah, there it is. I think I'll have some. Grab. Okay, so there, there it is again. Okay, um, uh, this is this is what I called my finished layout, which is you know no transitions, just the uh, pose blocked in uh, in step key. Ha. Look left, look right. Aha! I think I'll have some. And grab. Okay. So I didn't record that. Um, I keep it in my head, and um, you can too. You might, if you're, you're working from the comfort and the privacy of your own home, you probably want to record it just so that it doesn't change every time. Boof. Oh, see, this is now blocking, and so you know I didn't follow my own advice of keeping those step keys um, either in more of a copied pair approach. But you know, I've I've done this long enough that I kind of ha um, have a handle on those keys, and I can get it back to where I want it to be um, with with very little work. But here we go. Uh huh. Look left. Look right. Aha! There they are. I think I'll have some. And grab. And grab is also, I mean, the and is the anticipation, the grab is the grab. So, makes makes sense. And this is as far as I got. Um, I only had about an hour and a half to work on this, so um, maybe I'll finish the shot out and uh, upload it to the site later. 
Um, but here's the uh, first pass blocking of the of the shot. Poof. Aha! Look left, look right. Oh, there it is. I think I'll have some. And grab. So the I think you'll have some that little you know shuffle he does right up at the end. That's all completely derived from the inner monologue that I came up with for this shot. And it's a very very simple process. It's a it's a very quick process. It's not cheating. It's it, I equate it 100% to having a stopwatch. If the if the old masters had a timeline that they could put that stop, you know, whenever they started and stopped that stopwatch, you know, it was there and in front of them for the entire scene. I promise you they would. And um, and there's no reason not to take advantage of that there. Okay, so this was a scene that I was just beginning, and as you can see, there's no ambiguity in the timing. That inner monologue as a timing tool, extremely simple to make it so that it's a clear choice and that nothing ever gets you know too far off track. Okay, so um, let's wrap this up. Pantomime, it relies on your knowledge of body language and subtlety. But the subtlety is in the body language. Really try to resist the urge to do these you know, sign language gestures and superfluous movements because they're not going to get you anywhere. Using the inner monologue for, timing, for, for po planning, posing, and timing. Some car fundamentals carry extra implications in pantomime. Anticipation informs thought. We talked about how posing uh, with, the, with the body language is, is stronger than with you know, the tiny little gestures. And we talked a little bit about how... Um, um, what was the third one? Anticipation, uh, pose, and oh yeah, and variety and timing. Secondary action informs the subtext. Really, if you are interested in secondary action, I, I do think that the uh, the lecture on there is very informative and uh, maybe most valuable. Um, I brought about 55 examples of secondary actions to to the lecture, and this this is what lecture I did at CG Con in Montreal. So um, there's a crowd there, which is nice. Watch dialogue muted for clues if your work is using pantomime skills effectively. If you do one thing after watching this lecture, uh, it should be this. I hope that this is a change that you all make right now. Okay? Watch the... You know what I do? Um, this is probably, probably not good to admit, but I vote on the 11-second club uh, the first I, I go through a couple times actually. The first time I vote, I um, I vote with the sound muted. And the second time I go through, then I go through like you know it shows after you vote on all of them, it shows you all of them, and then you can and it's it's ordered so you can see the ones you supposedly like the best and whatever. Um, then I go to those, and I. Um, and then I unmute it, and then I finally listen to the to the dialogue. So that is l literally how important this is. And if I'm working on any sort of performance piece at the studio, um, I do the same thing. I watch I watch it muted. I watch demo reels muted. And that's why that's why recruiters, you've heard this like nightmare story, like oh my god, they're going to watch my reel muted. They're not going to get this, that, and the other. No, they are. They are. Don't worry. Show your work to lay viewers in order to, uh, to really see if you're getting the kind of point across that you want. And most importantly, have fun. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, my studio, if you are interested, is Arconics.com. You obviously are watching this on KennyRoy.com. I, uh, am, I am just having a blast. I, I can't thank you enough for being at the site and supporting the community. Um, please join in the site. Join in the forums, get into a discussion, post your work, and comment on others. Go into the uh, contact form and send me questions for the Ask Video Mail. Anything you want to see a demo on. I, I, get, uh, I get questions that I never thought would be issues, and I never thought that, uh, I never would have thought of myself. So, unless you want me to start thinking up ones that you never would have a problem with, then you need to put your, uh, your questions into the Ask Video Mail. So, just send an email to webmaster at kennyroy.com, or you can use the contact form to get your uh, question answered. And I really appreciate all of that. Because um, that really makes this site what it is. It's all about you guys having 
uh, access to uh, training that is catered to your needs and to your problems. So I'm here to help. All right. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope you got a lot out of this lecture. I have a, I had a blast making it. It was fun. And good luck with your animation. As always, rock on.